Hi, everyone. I am Sheila Edstrom, and I live in Northern Illinois. I teach at a large school called Stevenson High School, and I'm excited to help you review for the exam this upcoming year. And uh, I'm not doing it alone. I have a, a partner who's been just a super supportive, awesome um, leader in this endeavor. And uh, his name is Eastman. And Eastman, do you want to introduce yourself? Sheila, thanks for that great introduction. You've been wonderful to work with. Um, as well. I'm excited to finally get started filming these videos. We used to have all this like prep and now it's like time to go. Kind of like you guys taking this exam, like you've done all this prep and now you're just like ready to go. So we're glad that you're here. Um, but yeah, my name's Easton Landry. I'm coming out of Houston, Texas at the Kinder High School for the Performing and Visual Arts, um, HSPVA. And yeah, this has been a lot of fun. We're excited. I'll be doing videos two, four, six, and eight, all the evens. And Sheila over here, she's gonna be doing all the odds. So yeah, back to you, Sheila. Yeah, we flipped a coin for that, by the way. So um... <laughs> we did. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm, I'm. Thank you for for watching our videos, and I hope there's 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 um, some knowledge and um, confidence that can be gained from the the tips and the physics that we're reviewing with you. I'm excited. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll see you around, Sheila. Have a good time doing video one. All right, everyone. Welcome to our first review session for the AP Physics C E&M course. Um, so, what are we going to learn today? Um, we are taking a bit of an unconventional approach to the review for the ENM course. We're starting off with visualizing what charge does to space. So um, in all of our sessions, we're gonna begin with an equations review of relevant equations. Um, and particularly in this session, we are gonna talk about uh, the, the bending of the fabric of space when we have a charge present. Um, and we're gonna relate it to topographical maps in gravitational fields. Um, we'll talk about point charges and distribution of charges. Um, we will relate to changes in height um, in an electric field, which um, correlates to a change in height in a gravitational field. Um, and since we're defining this concept called potential, potential is related to potential energy and uh, electric fields are tough. Um, it's not like most of mechanics where you're in a uniform gravity field on earth. There's all sorts of charges, shapes. The field is never constant, <laughs> practically, you know, I should say never, but it's, 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 you have to visualize what is happening based on what you know about what's happening in space. So conservation of energy is a big deal. Um, we'll do some multiple choice practice and some free response practice, and then we'll offer you our, uh, our first testing tip. So equations on the equation sheet. So the college board defines electric potential energy related to potential. So this charge is a charge placed in a field where we've already defined what the potential is. And so that's, that's tough to visualize. Um, so if it's between two point charges, this is the expression given on the equation sheet. Um, the College Board likes to use one over four pi epsilon naught um, over K, Coulomb's constant, um, likely because when we derive these equations, we start with Gauss's law and one over four pi epsilon naught is the, the constant that appears. Um, we are gonna relate electric field to force. Um, We're gonna relate electric field to changes in potential. And whenever you see this D, um, for those of you that may not have as much experience in calculus, that just means a tiny little change potential. So if we're looking at the electric field in the X direction, we are saying that if we move in the X direction, there's going to be a tiny change of potential. Uh, this is also an expression on your equation sheet, which to me, if we said the electric field is in the X direction and we move in the X direction and then we solve for electric field, we're actually going to get this expression. Um, these two are not on the equation sheet, but I want you to think about a gravity field because you know we've all grown up with gravity, right? So if you drop a book, okay, so the force of gravity is down, the book's gonna move down and work is positive when the force and displacement are in the same direction. So when you drop a book, guess what? It's potential energy is going to decrease and that's where this negative sign is coming from. Now, if you decide to lift the book back up, so your force is up, and the movement is up again, your force and displacement are in the same direction. So that is positive work. And that positive work by an external force will um, produce a positive change in potential energy. Um, and these are constants that are relevant for this unit. 
Okay, so I want to let you know in all of our videos, uh, Eastman and I have put together a ton of resources and um, fun um, demonstrations. So please check out this link so that you can uh, take a uh, peek at the demonstrations as well as um, additional um, problem sets with solutions. So um, hopefully you'll find this a valuable resource. Okay, so the Grand Canyon is my favorite place on earth right now. Um, I, I did a 50 mile trek last summer and I'm headed again. Um, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. And you can see all of these elevation changes. You can see like right here, there's quite a huge elevation change compared to this region right here. So a topographical map, which you've all learned probably starting in middle school, shows those changes in height. So when you see um, lines in the top topographical map closely spaced together, that means that we are seeing massive um, height changes in a very short distance. Um, when they're further spaced in this region here, that's more, you know, flat. So um, think of that, you know, imagery, plus this beautiful image of the Grand Canyon, um, as we try to visualize electric fields, um, we don't call them topographical maps for electric fields, we call them contour maps. Okay, so this is a really great website. I highly recommend it. And um, I took an animation of it. And this is just a single positive charge and a single negative charge. And it doesn't say in the website, but they're both spherically shaped. And I know this based on the symmetry that I can see in the imagery. But let's take a peek. Um, what I, I did is, you know, I kind of look from different vantage points. So um, the positive charge is our mountain and the negative charge is our you know our valley as i call them and this is the contour map so because you know this animation was showing uh, uh equal positive versus negative charge the contour map for both is the same now why is the negative charge a valley um, think of a fabric of space and if you put a mass on it it's going to cause the fabric to sink and gravity is an attractive force and the way we define an electric field is based on what would happen if we placed a positive test charge in the field. So that would cause attraction to the negative charge. Um, so that's why the negative charge is a valley. Okay, so now we have two positive charges. Um, and you know, questions that are asked about this, be, the fabric of space, think of it as flat. Um, so if we have two positive charges, we are only lifting the fabric of space. So nowhere is the potential or the height zero, except off at infinity. Um, whereas with the positive and negative charge, there was a spot in between where we could define a zero. So here's a more visual um, of two positive charges. And it's, you know, it's it's the same visual that you've seen in the last two, but I like this one because it's not only showing the electric field vectors. So these are little bitty vectors, and an electric field points in the same direction as the force. On a positive charge um, and but it also shows like okay so we're going to try to add those vectors together and show the direction of the field lines and one piece i really want you to notice is that the field lines are always perpendicular per perpendicular to the potential lines and that's going to come up in future future sessions as well um, but because these are two positive charges both of the same magnitude we can see the symmetry in both the field lines um, the electric field lines and the potential lines uh, this next slide we don't have that same symmetry. And um, a concept that we'll speak of in future sessions is that the electric field surrounding a cylinder, that's what this is, is fundamentally different than the electric field that surrounds a positive charge. Um, surrounding a positive charge, as you get further away, the field weakens, um, and the field would be proportional to one over R squared. Same deal with a cylinder in that the fact the further you get away from it, it's going to weaken but the field is proportional to one over r so because the fields don't vary in the same way we don't have that you know that that symmetry that we saw on the last slide so here's another image i think this one is redundant but this side is really fun to play with um, so we can see that this is our positive charge there are field vectors leaving the positive charge and this is our negative charge there are field uh, electric field vectors uh, concluding on that negative charge and somewhere in between there is zero electric field so think back to the first animation i showed you of the mountain and valley somewhere between the mountain and valley we're at sea level so to speak um, this slide 
this is a hard one to conceptualize. Like, sure, we're looking at this. This is due to a single negative plate. So I'm going to tell you the plate, which was not shown in the simulation, is right here. So it's negative, and I know it's right here because the field lines are concluding a negative charge on both sides. But the part that I think is really, really tough to conceptualize is that students think that if I get further away from a negative charge, my field has to weaken. You know, that's that's our understanding of Earth's gravity. You know, even though we spend all of our time in a uniform field on Earth, because I doubt very few of us have been into space. You know, if you have, awesome, please tell me about it. But um, so we think as we get further away from Earth, we know the gravity field weakens. But if we assume that the Earth is flat, and we, we now know that it's not, <laughs> um, then the field is uniform. And so these field lines, if we drew an arrow to show the direction of these field lines, they're all parallel. And parallel lines never intersect. So be careful about that. Because if you have a plate and um, you're asked about the field, the, the field surrounding a plate does not weaken the further you get away from the plate. Um, the field surrounding a plate only depends on how much charge you can shove on the plate. Okay, so this is a, <laughs> a lot of fun making these slides because it was really fun for me to play with these fun sites. Um, I made this ring of charge. You know, and if I added more charges, I'm sure we would have seen more field vectors, but I have a positive ring of charge. Think of that ring as in the plane of your screen. And so um, the field is always going to point in the direction that um, a positive test charge would feel forced. So, you know, in a gravity field, we don't have to distinguish between a positive test mass and a negative test mass because there's no such thing as a negative test mass. Like I'm going to walk around my classroom, I'm going to drop a book and that's going to be my positive test ma mass. And guess what? It's always going to fall to the floor. <laughs> um, so outside we can see that it's pointing away. Now I drew these potential lines so that they were all 10 volts apart. So closest to my charge, you know, I look at the outside, the the potentials, the places where they're all the same potential. And as I said, I did it. And as I said, I did them all 10 volts apart. You can see they're more closely spaced, same deal on the inside. And as we get further away, they're further spaced. Um, so think back to that topographical map. And then I, I thought it'd be fun to actually try this with um, some equipment I have in my classroom. So I have this purple spandex. <laughs> and uh, basically that positive ring of charge would be, I mean, remember positive charge, um, since we define our field based on a positive test charge, a positive charge is gonna raise the fabric of space. So I have this ring here that raised the fabric of space. Now, the reason I put my finger down is because it's, it's spandex, <laughs> so, but um, but um, the 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 potential will decrease inside the ring, and it's going to decrease outside the ring. This is a bird's eye view. Um, so, for example, if we put our positive test charge in here, it's just going to move back and forth in here. You know, if we release it from rest, if we place our positive test charge out here, it's going to fall down, and it's going to go off to infinity. Um, so try to visualize that when you are asked to answer questions about what would happen in a charge. You know, try to think about how space is affected and how, um, how physics can be applied to describe um, the motion or whatever's being asked of you. So the uh, Michigan State University was so awesome to let me share this slide with you. Um, basically, it's what I've been trying to show you, but it's just such a beautiful animation in that they're saying that this object has a potential of 20 volts. So because it's a conductor, everywhere inside and on the surface, it's 20 volts. Um, and in future videos, we'll try to reinforce that it's a conductor. The charge sits on the outside. There is no electric field inside of a conductor. When there is an electric field inside of a conductor, that means we are pushing charges, which means we have a current. But this is electrostatics. So we don't have that. So since the field is zero, that means the potential is equal. And please refer back to the equations intro that if uh, the electric field is zero, then there's no change in potential. Um, now over here, um, the diagram's indicating that it's negative 20 volts. So that means there's negative charge. We have 
positive potential around positive charge. You know, it's our mountain. We have negative potential around negative charge. That's our valley. So, um, so anyway, so this is how um, Michigan State University like proceeded to like, you know, dissect this, you know, they show the potential lines here. So this potential line is all 15 volts, positive 15 volts. It's gotta be positive because we're surrounding a positive charge. And let's go down here, you know, surrounding um, my negative charge, I have negative potential. And then this next diagram showed, showed the field. And so one thing I want you to notice is that the electric field always leaves a surface in electrostatic equilibrium perpendicular to the surface. If that were not the case, like let's look at this one, this little electric field under here. Let's suppose it was not perpendicular. Let's suppose it was an angle. Well, that means there is a component that is perpendicular, but that also means there's a component parallel to the surface, which means there's going to be a force parallel to the surface, which means charges are going to be moving on the surface, and that's not electrostatics. Um, but this next image, but this next image I love um, because here, this is that fabric of space visual that I, I just want, I want to share with you and to have you think about, you know, if we, if we release a positive test charge here, it's totally going to fall down. But, and this is the crazy part with electrostatics, because we don't have, you know, planets shaped like this near other planets that have negative mass. <laughs> um, so, um, so if we release a negative charge down here, the negative charge actually wants to accelerate uphill. So, um, but I thought this was a great image of, of that charge distribution, how that fabric of space was being disrupted. So when we, this is just a problem that I threw in here because if you have um, two charge objects, you know, you'll have in this case, um, and the example I gave you, one of the spheres was positive and the other one is neutral. So initially, this one's going to create a mountain in the fabric of space. But as soon as I connect, you know, a thin conducting wire, a metal wire that charges can travel through. And, and then when you hear those words, electrostatic equilibrium, like that's big. Um, that means the charges aren't moving anymore. That means the electric field everywhere inside the both spheres, as well as the conducting wire is zero. So that means we just created an equal potential. So in thinking about the fabric of space, this is all at the same height. So, um, you know, this will come up in capacitors in a, a future video. If the potential is the same, um, we can talk about, you know, they're both spherical and this will be reviewed too, that, you know, we can calculate the potential due to a sphere, any spherically shaped object as one over four pi epsilon naught Q over R that's back from the equations review in the first, uh, one of the first slides. So they're equal. Um, and in this case, I'm saying that the radius of this sphere is three times the radius of the smaller sphere. So when you make that connection, what you're saying is that the charge that will sit on the surface of this large sphere is gonna be three times the charge um, that sits on the surface of the smaller sphere. And uh, you know, I made this up since, uh, sphere one initially had 12 microcoulombs, you know, I use that. I was like, okay, so whatever charge lands on sphere one and sphere two, it has to add up to 12 microcoulombs. I know the relationship to the charge between the spheres, and so I can figure out how much charge will be on each sphere. So the reason um, Eastman and I decided to start with this approach is that conservation of energy is just such a massive deal like you can do so much with it so while these two relations are not on the sheet there's a lot of questions asked about it and um, if you look at the equation sheet carefully you actually can piece this together you know as i said in reviewing the uh the equations if the field is doing positive work then the object is going to go to a lower potential energy level you know drop in the book. Um, and if I want to pick the book up, then I'm doing positive work and that's going to cause um, an increase in potential energy. So just, you know, these reminders, like try your best to visualize what's going on. Um, try your best to draw diagrams. Try your best to think about how the physics you've learned applies to the scenario that you presented. So this is actually just something I also decided to throw in. Um, this is just a handout to give my kids on day one. Um, you know, let's think about like, let's unpack what's going on here. Um, so I have all these potential lines. These are eco potentials. And 
you know, I, I tell my students all the time that when I give them handouts, I'm not super cautious about the details that I give them, but if I'm going to give them an exam, and certainly when they take their exam with the college board, there's attention to detail. So I should have positive signs in front of all of these potential values. But the fact that they are decreasing means I'm going downhill. Um, so I tried to draw the electric field lines. And again, notice how they're always perpendicular to the potential lines. Um, and I know that we are directed this way because this, whatever's here has to be a positive charge um, because I have positive potentials, um, even if the irresponsible physics teacher forgot to put in a plus science. Um, and so, you know, just look through these questions. You know, if we release a proton at point A, it's going to move away. <laughs> so it's going to accelerate in the direction of the field lines. So the big ideas here is conservation of energy. You know, as the kinetic energy increases, the potential energy will decrease and potential energy is related to potential. So um, the change in potential energy is absolutely related to the change in potential and going through the math, you can figure out um, the change in kinetic, kinetic energy of the proton. All right, so here's some more examples, you know, and, and again, like I added in here as I was, you know, hopefully providing some resources for you. When you're asked how much work is done, you have to say by what, right? So um, I have how much work is done by an external force here, like that has to be known. So um, the field is not going to bring the proton from C, a lower potential back to A. So that is going to cause an increased potential energy and um, check out the math. Um, now, if we try to move another charge from C to D. You know, if you look at that diagram again, C and D are at the same potential. So the field and an external force are not gonna do any work because there's no change in potential. Um, so, and then this is a very similar question that I wrote to be like, okay, I like the first one, you know, you release a particle, it's going to accelerate a positive particle. It's gonna accelerate in the direction of the field lines. However, now we have a negative charge. So it's going to accelerate in the direction opposite the field lines. Electrons like to accelerate uphill. So um, please check out the math. So these questions are very basic, but my experience is that these basics are so tough to conceptualize. So um, make sure that you um, understand that potential is related to the space. You know, we're we're describing that. You know that 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 transition from uphill to downhill or uphill to another uphill, um, but potential energy is describing the particle that we put in that space. So please go through these and please talk to your physics teacher if, you, if you're not in agreement with, with uh, the highlighted answers. Okay, so this is just another reminder of positive work versus negative work. Um, positive work happens when the force, so I have it here, when the force and the displacement are in the same direction. This is a dot product. Absolutely use your math cheat sheet. And the magnitude of a dot product is the magnitude of the first times the magnitude of the second times the cosine of the angle between them. So when both force and displacement are in the same direction, the angle between them is zero. And the cosine of zero is one. When they're in opposite directions, well, now the angle is 180 degrees. Um, so that's the math piece of this. And by the way, this expression is the same thing as this expression, which is given to you on the equation sheet, but it's just assuming a constant force. So if I pull my force out of the integral because it's constant, then I'm left with, okay, let's just add up all these tiny little displacements. So that's what I call D. Um, but just keep that in mind because it comes up a lot. Um, I've seen a lot of multiple choice questions where, you know, the positive value and the negative value are given. So you need to understand um, which force is doing the work and is it positive or negative. All right, so here is a, a very lame picture that Sheila made. Um, and it's just, it, it's trying to find the work done to push positive charges together. So positive charges don't wanna be near each other. Like they don't wanna repel. So if I wanna bring positive charges at the corners um, of this uh, equilateral triangle, then I need to do it. I need to be the external force, right? So um, just know that the particle here and here, I'm gonna have to do work to push them together. And so there's gonna be a potential energy between that two particle system. Um, the same is true between this particle and this particle. I have to work to you know, smush them together. So there'll be positive work done there. And also 
with these two. So the work done um, by an external force to push these particles together, I have to consider the energy between every pair so that there's three pairs there. Okay, so I love the brain lifting weights. So we're going to lift some weights right now. Okay, so these are some questions that I found that I, I felt were um, straightforward in the concepts. You know, there's, there's way more nasty questions that these um, test writers have uh, contrived for you. Um, so this first one, it says the electric potential is negative at some point on this line. Well, I have two positive charges here. So think about that fabric space and both charges are gonna lift the fabric space. So the only place the potential could even be zero is way off at infinity. There's no place it can be negative. Um, throw a negative charge in there. Yeah, for sure. We can find a place where the potential is negative. Um, the next one, you know, here's that work done and I love by an external agent. Um, <laughs> so, um, so the work done by an external agent to move this charge from whatever, whatever. So we're increasing the potential energy because there's positive work done. So um, just in relating that, you know, this is the work done by this external force, which will increase the potential energy. Relating potential energy to potential difference, um, we can solve for the uh, um, potential difference. Um, and this next one, the particles moving at a constant speed. So boom, there's no change in kinetic energy um, and there's no work done by or against the field. So, okay. <laughs> so in terms of what's going on here, we have to be on an equal potential. If you're on an equal potential, there's no potential difference. So there can't be any work done. And the fact that it noted there was a constant speed, there's, there's no other energy changes um, noted in this scenario. Okay, so let's review. Um, so I have spent a lot of time looking at the exam description and you know, I think it's valid to, to know what is expected of you. So um, yes, charges create a field. And yes, I think it's helpful to visualize how the space around that charge is affected due to that charge. Um, the total energy, yeah, you have to consider all the particles in the system and they can transfer energy to one another. And honestly, with um, the vast majority of electrostatics, it's really, really helpful to use energy concepts because we're not in that uniform gravity field that we spent most of mechanics in. Uh, we're not even in um, the, the radially inward gravity field when we did uh, universal law of gravity in mechanics. We are in all sorts of fields with all sorts of different shapes from due to charges of all different uh, shapes as well. Um, so I found some practice multiple choice for you. Um, here is our first multiple choice question. Um, it's saying that we have a constant potential difference maintained between plates. And it's asking you like you release a product from one and you know what happens when it hits the other. So I did some conservation of energy. And um, in the end, I was like, okay, so the kinetic energy is directly related to the potential difference. So that means the speed is gonna be proportional to the square root of the potential difference. Uh, here's another map that I found um, from a released exam. So here we see all these um, equal potentials. Um, it's, I, don't, I don't see any negative potentials. Um, so I'm gonna focus on that there must be a positive charge here and there likely is a negative charge somewhere over here. Um, but it's asking for the work to move this uh, negative charge um, from C to E. So from C to E, we are going uphill. And negative charges love to accelerate uphill. That's what a field does to them. So the work by an external agent is going to be negative. In it. And this is where the whole positive negative work piece is tough. My advice is that you think about positive work first. So I would have to do positive work on a positive charge to raise it up the hill. Um, so with negative charges, it's, it's, it's the opposite. Um, another potential map to look at, um, and this, there are three questions that go with this potential map. Um, this is a positive potential, this is a negative potential. So we've got a positive charge here and I can see I'm going downhill. I've got a negative charge here and you can see that I'm going downhill. Um, so uh, first question is, um, we want no work done. So if you want no work done, 
then you can't have a change of potential. So the only place, the only options given where there's no change of potential is from A to C. Um, if we wanted to uh, have a net positive work by an external force, like what is the largest amount of net positive work? Well, that means we want to bring, um, this is for a positively charged particle, we want to bring it from as low as we can, you know, in the valley to as high as we can on the mountain. And so that biggest difference in potential from low to high is this choice right here. Um, and the last question is what could create this? And so I'll ask you to refer back to the image where I had a cylinder and a sphere. Um, and we saw that there was you know, a lack of symmetry. So without even reading the choices, this map to me could be from a positive point charge and a negative point charge. And we're just looking at the contour map. But if we go through these, uh, um, these options, I showed you the ring of positive charge. That's definitely not what it looks like. Um, and I showed you a sheet, definitely not what it looks like. Um, two negative charges would mean that there was negative potential here. And we certainly wouldn't have zero potential in between that. Um, so here is, this is the best answer. So there are, there are two conductors um, going into the screen and we have that, um, we have that, we have that symmetry. Um, okay, so, um, and this last one, that's, that's, that's precisely why I added that image of the cylinder and the point charge. Um, you're going to lack that symmetry. So this question is what prompted me to uh, talk about like pushing charges together on a triangle. This is from a released exam as well, but now we're going to push four charges together. Um, I think this is called a tetrahedron. I don't know. I had to look it up. I think that's what it is. But anyway, it's, it's an equilateral triangle um, on all sides and the base. So basically you have to consider, and I, I numbered the charges, you have to consider the work done to push charge one and two together. And I even I listed, you know, I got to think about pushing one and two together and pushing one and three together and pushing one and four together. But then I also have to worry about two and three and two and four and then three and four. And those are all the pairs that I could find. So when we consider the potential energy from each pair, you have to consider the potential energy from all these pairs. And so that's why uh, E is our correct answer. Okay, so now let's go over an FRQ. This is um, a problem that uh, um, it, it's tough to find a question with only potential. Normally their questions have potential, potential energy, and it, it throws in some calculus. Um, so this, uh, and we're only gonna go through part of this and um, there are other parts where like, watch a future video and we'll go through the rest. Um, but this is an arc of charge. And the first question is to rank the potential um, due to this arc of charge. So think of that purple spandex and think of Sheila somehow creating this arc and you know uh, lifting the spandex. Okay, so B is closest to this arc of charge and that's why I ranked it the largest. You know, Think of that fabric of space slanting down. And then you can argue by symmetry that A and C are both equidistant away from this, this arc of charge and they'll be at the same height in um, the fabric of space. So here's the next two questions. Feel free to stop the video and read them. Now let's go through them. Um, so B is asking to find the electric potential at P. Um, so since it's a, a distribution of charge and Eastman's gonna go over this hardcore um, in the next session with, you know, he calls it his calculus party, which I love. Um, but basically you have to break up the charge into an infinite number of infinitesimally small bits. So I did that and what Eastman's going to do with you in the next few is far more scary because he's going to be doing it with vector quantities. With scalar quantities, it is way better. Um, so when you say, okay, I'm going to add up all the tiny changes in potential, that's what the D means, it's a tiny change. And um, these tiny changes in potential are from these tiny charge um, that we have, you know, we've broken up into our infinitesimally small um, uh, uh, charge particles. So when you pull out what stays constant, so K is a constant, absolutely the charge is all the same distance away from point P, so you can pull out R. So this just says add up all those little bits of charge um, in the arc, which was given, it's plus Q. Um, so if this is why I chose this question, because as I said, um, AP um, Physics C um, FRQs combine a lot of ideas together. And 
I love these questions. If we place a positive charge here, uh, it's going to repel. And as it moves away, it's getting further from our charge distribution. So the force is going to get weaker. Um, so this is definitely a scenario where you want to use energy. Um, because if you have a changing force, that means you have a change in acceleration, which means you cannot use the kinematics um, relationships, you know, those first three equations on the physics C equation sheet. So here I applied conservation of energy. Initially, I was not moving, but I had some potential energy. And a long time later, so much further later, that I no longer am even close to this distribution charge. Well, then it's all kinetic. And so I plugged in values and I solve for the speed. So this is a Shilo problem <laughs> that I added um, because I love linearizations. Uh, this is from the Physics Avery website and I'll show you what happens. This is really exciting, um, <laughs> being sarcastic. So basically we're launching a particle um, towards a fixed charged particle and they're both positive and two positive charges don't want to attract. So eventually it's gonna stop and then super exciting it's going to repel. <laughs> so um, the distance between here and here where it stopped is called the distance of closest approach. So I was like, okay, let's do a lab, you know, and this is from zooming for an entire year from home. We're like, we're going to make up a lab here. Um, and so what I proposed is like, okay, let's vary the initial velocity of this moving charge when we first, you know, sent it uh, toward the fixed charge. And let's see how that affects the, um, the distance of closest approach. So um, I will confess, I kind of made up this graph um, and made up data, but still it's, it's legit in terms of the physics. So just some reminders when you have a graph, um, if you are given data points, make sure you draw the best fit line, try to have as many points above the line as below the line. And um, so what I am pro proposing to you is let's say you put the data that I didn't take um, into some kind of graphing app and you know the 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 app spit out this equation of the line. So it's not it's not stating what you varied, and what you vary goes on the horizontal axis. So we varied the speed. So something with the speed has to go on the horizontal axis. It might not be the speed, but something related to speed has to be on the horizontal axis. And then we measured its distance of closest approach. So something about that final distance has to be in my vertical axis. So let's do some physics. Um, I 100% recommend conservation of energy because you saw that vector. And if not, please go back and watch it gets smaller and smaller. So the force is changing on the moving particle, which means the acceleration is changing, which means you cannot use kinematics, um, those first three equations on the equation sheet. So in using conservation of energy, I was like, okay, we start off some kinetic and some potential energy, but when we stopped, it's all potential. So then I remembered like, oh, right. Yeah, we changed the velocity. So I rearranged this expression to put it in y equals mx plus b format. Um, and I purposely wrote it like this. And I purposely highlighted one over the final position is going to be in my vertical axis. This is what my slope is. Um, and on the horizontal axis, I'm actually going to be plotting the speed, the initial speed squared. And then this is my y-intercept, which honestly, if you think about it, it, makes sense. If you're plotting one over the final position, then your y-intercept has to be one over some distance. And so that some distance is uh, the initial position. I went here and showed the math for you. And you know, if you were just given the, the, the charges of the particles, um, big Q is the fixed particle, little q is the moving one. So I took my expression for the slope. Uh, this was what the graphing app I used spit out at me. And I have all the other um, given information. Don't forget to reference the tables of an information sheet for the metric system because it's there. Um, so nano is times 10 to the negative 9. And I solved for the mass. And if you look back at the original animation that I shared with you, um, we solved for 619 times 10 to the negative 6 kilograms. Uh, it's pretty close to that. It was maybe 620, maybe 621, but still, we did use our data to appropriately solve for the mass of the particle. And then as far as the y-intercept, um, that's one over the initial position. Um, the, the graphing app I used spit out that the y-intercept is 14.9, which means this is my initial position. And again, um, 
that looks like one, two, three. That looks like 67 millimeters. And since I have the diagram right here, ooh, we're spot on. We did well. Okay, so linearizations and graphing with data, it's always good to practice that. Um, so here's another question that I thought I'd throw in there for my Sheila problem. Um, I wanted to know how far is this the moving charge moving when it's very far away. So think about this, this moving charge approaching the fixed charge. It stops and then it repels <laughs> and it just keeps repelling. So, um, so now I, I used my, my given um, information, you know, it was initially moving. It initially had some potential energy and it doesn't matter that I'm looking that it stopped and now I'm looking very far away, well beyond its starting point. Um, when we are very far away, we're only left with kinetic energy. So um, I, uh, I did the physics, I showed you the numbers, um, and honestly, I don't know what the answer is because, as I said, Jill's calculator challenge. But still, that's how you do the physics. And if you can't use a calculator either, then you only lose one point um, on your exam. OK, so here is another APFRQ that I chose, um, kind of a fun looking equipotential map. Um, and so, you know, in, in going through this, you know, please pause to actually read the question. Um, the first one is to calculate the, the value of this charge. So when I look at this, I know Q1 has to be negative. And I know this because between Q1 and Q2, there is a region where the potential is zero. If I had two positive charges, there's no way I would have zero potential anywhere but at infinity. So, um, so I did do the math and said, OK, well, the potential at B, it's a very clear um, reading right here. Um, is zero. And um, when I say clear reading, like this is a nice spot to read in the graph. And so the total potential is going to be the potential of both. Um, you were given information about the second charge. So I went ahead and solved for the first charge. And yes, it will be negative. Please remember that potential is a scalar quantity. Um, for part B, they want you to draw the electric field line. And um, pandemic year, the College Board was forced to remove magnetism. And the E part had um, a lot of conceptual questions about, you know, just work done in a field, which way is, um, which way is the field directed? And they were mean uh, because they, they chose places in the graph where students be like, okay, I figured out this is negative, so I'm gonna draw the field towards it. Um, but that's, that's, you, that's not okay. You have, to, you have to draw your field line perpendicular to the equipotential or you won't get credit. It has to be clear that you're drawing your field line uh, perpendicular to the equipotential. And um, as I drew here, it is directed towards-ish the negative charge. Definitely not away from it because this charge is negative. Um, and as I said here, watch future videos um, and please come back and review. I did mention this equation on the equation sheet, um, but I didn't do it um, with, you know, deltas, I did it with tiny changes. Um, but since they're asking you to approximate, totally fine to, to look at um, the approximate you know, change potential, but just like looking at the potential lines over your best estimation of the distance. And as for this one, please do watch future videos. So this is the rest of the question. Um, please feel free to pause. I'm going to go on to my solution. So um, party is asking you, if you place an electron at A, so let's look at our diagram, that's right there. So an electron is gonna to want to attract positive charge. So which way is it gonna be forced? It's gonna be forced towards Q2. Um, as far as the work done, the work done by the field, remember when you have the, the, the force from the field doing work, that force will always bring our object to the lowest possible potential. Um, you drop a book, it's going to fall and it's going to reach a lower potential energy state. So um, that is the work that I showed right here. And um, it looks like this graphic, oops, it looks like this graphic was cut up by some of this. But if you if you look at the change of potential, all good. This is the answer you're going to get. Um, now for um, part E double I, you want to find the speed. Well, the work done by the field is going to lead to a decrease in potential energy, which is going to lead to an increase in kinetic energy. So I stated that and I solved for the speed. Um, as far as direction, you know, as we said, you place an electron at A, it's going to want to be forced to the left. So there's our force. And 
I also noted here, please remember that electrons like to accelerate uphill. So if this is my mountain and this is my valley, the electron is going to want to accelerate up the mountain. So what should we take away? Um, so in this video, I, I wanted you to get in the habit of trying to visualize space and what charges do to space and then making your best judgment of how to apply the physics. Um, please remember um, that speed relates to kinetic energy and any changes in kinetic energy relate to changes in electric potential energy, which yes, is related to electric potential. Um, when we're talking about forces, those are vectors, we're talking about acceleration and we're relating to fields. And if your force is changing, Please remember that means your acceleration is changing, which you, means you may not use kinematics. Okay, so our first exam tip, you have to know the exam format. So um, every AP Physics C exam has two sections. This is also um, the same with mechanics. There is a multiple choice section and there is a free response section. Uh, for the multiple choice, there are 35 questions in 45 minutes. And I know I say in a future slide, I'll just say it now, that's 1.2857 minutes per question. So you have to watch your timing. Um, with free response, there's three questions. That means you wanna average about 15 minutes per question. Um, but there will be, I'm sure every year there is like a zinger question that requires a little bit more and a less challenging question that might require a little less time, but that is your gauge uh, for your timing. Familiarize yourself with the equation sheet. So um, <laughs> I have been joking with my students uh, for the last uh, few weeks because I've been teaching this course for 15 years and this is the first time ever I actually read the box on the tables of information sheet. <laughs> so read the box. Um, for this session, the big deal is that we're defining the electric potential at, um, as zero at infinity. Um, these are assumptions that are um, suggested in taking the exam. Um, future sessions, you know, we define current, the direction that a positive charge would flow, which is silly because it's electrons that are moving. So anyway, take a look at these uh, at the box. Um, use the math cheat sheet. So that is the third page. Um, if you Google AP Physics C um, equation sheet, you'll be linked right to the College Board. And it's a three-page document. The first page is the tables of information, where you'll find this box. Um, second page is all the equations. The third page is the math cheat sheet. So if you're not confident with calculus, please know this is not a calculus exam. You're being tested on your physics knowledge. So use the math cheat sheet, um, particularly with, with the calculus and also um, vector products, you know, dot product, cross product. Um, so here, here it is, 1.287 minutes per question. So, I mean, it's, it's, you got to move. It's, it's fast. Um, and then this suggestion, I have heard stories of students who waited till the end to bubble. And then the time, you know, 45 minutes was reached and they had nothing bubbled and their exam was taken away. So come up with a way that works for you to make sure you're bubbling as you move along. Um, and a really good idea, if you look on the College Board website, there are release exams, take one, see how long it takes you, see, you know, time yourself. Um, for the FRQ, the goal is to show the person reading your exam what you know. So um, try not to leave anything blank. Try to put down relevant um, relationships. Um, you know, as I said, and for my last one, use, like, state the big ideas and state it with letters. <laughs> you know, don't start with numbers that you think are correct from a previous spot, because if your previous numbers are incorrect, the reader is not going to go and figure out where you were headed. Like, so start with the big idea, you know, conservation of energy um, or Newton's second law or, um, you know, think to mechanics, conservation of momentum, you know, just start with the big ideas. Um, and if you get stuck on one of the parts, because the way the exam is written is so that um, it, it, it sequences through the ideas they want you to capture in the problem. And this is not only done for you, but this is also done to create um, consistency for the readers reading your exam. So if you're just stuck on part B or whatever it is, and you don't know where to go, and you know you need the answer from that part for the next part, then just make up a number and make sure you use units. So um, for example, if, if, it's, if part B is asking you to find velocity and you can't, 
then in part C say if velocity equals and make up a nice number 10 meters per second and then continue you will not be penalized for future sections of the exam. Oh my gosh so it's a lot of talking I don't talk this much in class. Um, uh, I hope you <laughs> were able to pull some together some ideas, thank you, and thank you so much for watching we'll see you next time.